Oh, you who believe, give charity for the pleasure of Allah, the pleasure of Allah. Oh, you who believe, read the Quran every night of Ramadan, night of Ramadan. Welcome, oh Ramadan. Ramadan. It is Ramadan. Dear brothers and sisters in Islam and humanity, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May the peace, the mercy, and the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be on all of you. Welcome to the show. Ramadan, a date with Dr. Zakia. I'm your host, Yusuf Chambers, and today we are discussing the topic Ramadan, the month of self-improvement, and Islam, part four. Dr. Zakia, assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So, Dr. Zakia, the first question I'd like to um, draw your attention to is regarding the use of the right hand over the left which I understand is a sunnah, inshallah, you're going to explain that. Can you explain why the right hand is preferred in such things as eating, greeting and other things, and the left is not uh, preferred at all? Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salam. Al Rasulillah. Wa ala ali wa sabi ajmain. Amma bad. Auzu billahi min shaitanir rajim. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. Rabbi shahli sadri. Wa yisalli amri. Wa ahlul ugdata min lisani yafqahu qawli. As far as right hand being preferred, in Islam, the things which are honorable, the things which are mustahab, the things which get blessings, the things which are good, are supposed to be done with the right hand. And the others, like leading, etc., are supposed to be done with the left hand. And according to the sunnah of the Prophet Wasallam, we have to eat with the right hand, we have to drink with the right hand, we have to shake hands with the right hand. And a person, when he wears a garment, he should wear the right hand side first. If he's wearing a shirt, it should be right hand first. If he's wearing a trouser, then right leg first. If he's wearing a footwear, again the right leg first. And similarly, when a person is doing wudu, the right limb should be first. The right hand first, then the left hand. The right leg first, then the left leg. While you're entering the masjid, it should be with the right foot. If you're completing your salah and doing salam, then the right side first. If you're touching the black stone, it should be with the right hand. If you're combing your hair, then right side, trimming your moustache, right side, cutting the nails, right hand first. If you're removing the unwanted hair from the body, again right side first. If it's shaving the head, then again right side first. And if you're exiting the toilet, it is right leg first. And if you're putting kohel in your eyes, again the right side first. And if you are doing miswak, if you're doing sawak, then again, right side first. So these are the sunnah of the Prophet, which the Prophet has taught us. And as I mentioned that the things which are to clean and which are not honorable, that's with the left hand. For example, when you're removing your garments, it is the left side first, you're removing your shirt, then left hand. If you're removing your trousers, the left leg. If you're removing your footwear, then again, left leg and left foot first. You are exiting the mosque, then the left leg. If entering the toilet, again, left leg. If you're cleaning, maybe going to the toilet and cleaning your part of the body, then again, it is the left hand. If you're blowing the nose, it's left hand. So this is the differentiation. And you find several hadith mentioning these things. It's mentioned in the hadith of Sayyid Bukhari, volume number seven, in the book of Foods, hadith number 5376, where the beloved Prophet says, he says to a young boy that, say Bismillah before eating. Take the name of Allah before eating. Eat with the right hand and eat what is next to you. It's mentioned say Muslim. Volume number three, in the book of drinks, hadith number 5010, the Prophet said, La ta'kulu bi fa inna which means, do not eat and drink with the left hand, for the Satan eats and drinks with the left hand. So that is the reason you see that most of the Muslims who follow the sunnah and who are pious, they don't eat and drink with the left hand. But normally when we have our food, when we're having lunch, having dinner, we're having it with our hands, and if you don't drink water, 
most of the people because their right hand is dirty. They have with the left hand, but in order to follow the hadith, they put the right hand down. So you may have noticed that instead of having directly, they put the left hand and put the right hand down so that, you know, it indicates they're having with the right hand so that don't dirty the glass. But Sheikh Nasruddin Albani, he has objection to this. He says that if the hadith would have said that drink with the right hand or eat with the right hand, then that act would not be right. What the hadith says of Muhammad do not drink and eat with the left hand for the Satan eats and drinks with the left hand. So even doing this, he objects. He says, even though your right hand is dirty, you can pick up the glass with the right hand because it's preferable to dirty the glass than to dirty the soul. So he even disagrees having with the left hand and putting a right hand below. He says, have it directly with the right hand. If the glass gets dirty, no problem. It's preferable to dirty the glass than to dirty the soul. This is the difference of opinion that Sheikh Nasr Dalmani has. May Allah have mercy on him. Furthermore, it's mentioned in the hadith of Abu Dawud in the book of Foods, hadith number 4129. The beloved Prophet Muhammad said that do the right side first while you're doing wudu and while you are putting on a garment. The Prophet said, use your right hand first when you're putting on a garment and when you're doing wudu and then you can use the left later on. Further, it's mentioned in the hadith of Abu Dawud, volume number one, hadith number 33. It's mentioned that Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that you should use your right hand for getting food and use your right hand for doing ablution, right side first, and then use the left side. And if you're washing, then use the left side. And further mention in the hadith of Sayyid Muslim, hadith number 504, the beloved Prophet said that do not use the right hand for things like washing, etc. You have to use the left hand for things like washing, etc. And based on this, mashallah, it's a sunnah that as I mentioned, we do good things and the honorable things, the mustab thing with the right hand and the other with the left hand. And regarding the logic behind this is that medical science tells us today that the left side of the brain, it controls the right side of the body. And the right side of the brain, it controls the left half of the body. And today science tells us that more than 90% of the human beings, their left hemisphere of the brain is dominant. That's the reason more than 90% of the human beings, they are righty. Where the left side of the brain is dominant. So most of the things that people do, whether Muslim or non-Muslim, they use the right side. But Islam encourages us for doing the good things with the right hand and the things which are not cleaning, etc. use the left side. And the reason is that normally most of the people use only left hemisphere of the brain because they're righty. But Islam encourages us to use right hand, right side of the body for the good things, but even tells us to use the left side for doing things which are not honorable, or things which are opposite. So here, a human being, besides doing things, the good things right hand, he is forced to use his left side, for example, while exiting the mosque, you have to exit with the left foot. For entering the toilet, you have to enter with the left foot. So here, we make a conscious effort. For example, removing the garment. Normally, people use the right hand, they put the garment to the right hand and they remove with the right side. This is a normal habit. So here, we deliberately, consciously use the left side for removing the garment, left side for removing the footwear. So here, we are even utilizing the other part of the brain, though less than the right side. So it gives a good exercise to the brain and it is much more better for the brain. So scientifically also, it's better, what the Prophet said, more things we do with the right hand, but we consciously do certain things with the left hand. So that is a good nourishment and exercise for the brain. Yet again, a demonstration of the balance in Islam. Okay. Alhamdulillah. Next question. Uh, what is the ruling for drinking whilst a person may be standing um, in Islam? There are no less than six hadith only in Sahih Muslim, which forbid a Muslim from drinking while standing. A beloved Prophet Muhammad said, it's mentioned in Sahih Muslim, volume number three in the book of drinks, hadith number 5017. The Prophet disapproved drinking while standing. Sahih Muslim, volume number three, book of drinks, hadith number 5018. The Prophet forbade a person 
from drinking while standing. It's further mentioned in Sahih Muslim, volume number three, in the book of drinks, hadith number 5020, the Prophet warned from drinking while standing. It's also mentioned in Sahih Muslim, volume number three, in the book of drinks, hadith number 5022, the beloved Prophet said, none shall drink while standing. So all these hadith that disapprove of a person from drinking while standing, immediately the next five hadith, Sahih Muslim, volume number three, book of drinks, hadith number 5023 to 5027, the next five hadith say, that the Prophet drank Zamzam water while standing. And also mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number two, in the book of Hajj, hadith number 1637, the beloved Prophet Muhammad it says that he drank Zamzam water while standing. So based on these hadith, all the scholars actually agree that drinking while sitting is mustahab. And you can stand and drink only when you have zamzam water. This is what some of the scholars, they have given the ruling. But there are various other hadith which also show that besides zamzam water, the Prophet even drank the normal water while standing. It's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number seven, in the book of drinks, hadith number 5615. It says, the Hazrat Ali, may Allah be pleased with him. He walked towards the courtyard of a mosque and he drank water while standing. And he said, I know that many people think it is disapproved, it's makhru, it's disliked for a person to drink while standing, but I've seen the Prophet drink while standing the way I'm drinking now. And further it's mentioned in the hadith of Musnad Ahmad, volume number one, hadith number 797, which says that Hazrat Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, that once he was drinking while standing and the people looked at him and they stared at him and he said that, why are you looking at me? I'm doing what the Prophet did. I drink while standing because I've seen the Prophet drink while standing. I also sit while drinking because I've seen the Prophet sit and drink. And it's mentioned in the Hadith of Tirmidhi, Hadith number 1881, that Ibn Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, he said that he along with the Prophet, in the company of the Prophet, he many a time used to eat while walking and should drink while standing. So based on these hadith, we come to know, the majority of the scholars, they agree that sitting and drinking is mustahab, is the act which is preferred because it is a commandment of the Prophet. As I mentioned earlier, whenever a commandment and action of the Prophet contradicts, the commandment carries more weight because commandment is a normal ruling. An action, maybe there was a requirement, it was urgency, whatever it is. So the mustahab is to sit and drink. But because the Prophet even sometimes stood and drank, Standing and drinking is also allowed, but it comes in the category of makru. That is, it is detestable, you will not get any punishment, but you can stand and drink because the Prophet also stood and drank. So as I mentioned earlier that it was a need, therefore standing and drinking is not haram. Some people have misconception that standing and drinking is haram. So it's not haram, it's makru. It's preferred to sit and drink. Can you, uh, doctor, furthermore to your last answer, can you um, now sum up the etiquettes of drinking? As far as the sunnah and the etiquettes of drinking are concerned, number one is you should say bismillah before drinking. You should drink with the right hand. You should sit while drinking. Number four, you should drink water in three gulps or more. You should not have it in one gulp, finish it. Number five, after finishing drinking, you should praise Allah, say Alhamdulillah. Number six is that if someone is serving drinks to other people, if there are a group of people or there are guests coming, he should have the last drink. Number seven, he should start serving from the right hand side. Number eight, a person should not drink from the pitcher. He should pour it into a cup or a glass and then have it. All these are hygienic, you know, normally when you have from the pitcher, then you know, it's preferable to have in the glass and leave the complete water clean. And the last is, and the ninth one is, that you should not drink in a gold or a silver vessel. So these are the etiquettes and the sunnah of drinking water. Zakalak here for the answers. And Dr. Zakir, we've arrived at the last question for today in the interview phase. And it's uh, quite a straightforward and simple one. You do hear many Muslims 
pronounce Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim before they eat. Is this a sunnah? As far as my knowledge goes, I have not heard of any Sahih Hadith. I have not come across any Sahih Hadith, any authentic Hadith in which the Prophet said that before eating you have to say Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, or the Prophet said Bismillahir Rahman before eating. In fact, all the Hadith that I know, he only said Bismillah. And even if you read the Hadith of Sahih Bukhari, volume number seven in the Book of Foods, Hadith number five three seven six, the Prophet says to a young boy that before eating, say the name of Allah, say Bismillah, and eat with the right hand and eat what is close to you. Even the Hadith of Hadith Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her, it's mentioned in Sunan Abu Dawud, volume number three in the Book of Foods, Hadith number three seven five eight. Hadith Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her, the Umm al may Allah be pleased with her. She said that when you eat, you should say Bismillah in the name of Allah. And if you forget to say Bismillah before eating, then whenever you remember, say Bismillah wa awwal wa akhiru, which means that in the name of Allah in the beginning and in the name of Allah towards the end. So this is the teaching of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu but unfortunately, people, because of lack of knowledge, they say, pull Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim in the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful. And when I reminded one of the brothers that, you know, Bismillah is right, authentic, what is the harm? Bismillah ar-Rahman is more in the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful. Isn't it better than Bismillah? I said, if the Prophet didn't say it, then do you think you want to improve on the Prophet? So then I asked him, the same logic if I use when I'm slaughtering the animal, when you are sacrificing the animal, you say Bismillah. Bismillah, Allah Akbar. You can't say Bismillah, Rahman, Rahim, in the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful. Imagine you're slaughtering an animal and then saying in the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful. So unfortunately, Muslims, because of lack of knowledge, instead of following the Quran, the Sahih Hadith, they try and use their own logic and they try and improve, which is totally wrong. We should follow what Allah and the Rasul have said. Jazakallah khair. And I can't deny any of the answers at all. <laughs> the next question is, what is the Islamic dress code for men and women Islam? Quite a long question. <laughs> as far as the Islamic dress code is concerned, there are a few guidelines given in the Quran as well as the Hadith. Allah first speaks about the hijab for the male and for the female in the Quran. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 30, say to the believing man that he should lower his gaze and guard his modesty. That means whenever a man looks at a woman, any brazen thought comes, he should lower his gaze. Once there was a person, a Muslim, staring at a girl for a long time. I told him, brother, what are you doing? It's haram in Islam. So he said, our beloved Prophet said, the first glance is forgiven, the second is prohibited. I have not completed half my glance. That does not mean you can look at a girl for 10 minutes without blinking and saying, I have not completed my glance. Later on comes the dress code. The next verse speaks about the hijab for the woman. It's mentioned in Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 31. Say to the believing woman that she should lower her gaze and guard her modesty. And display not a beauty except what appears ordinarily of. And to draw her head covering over the bosom. And display not a beauty except to her husband, her son, and a big list of mahram, the close relatives who she can't marry is given. Basically, there are six criteria for the hijab for the man and woman. The first is the extent, which for the man, it's from the navel to the knee. For the woman, the complete body should be covered. The only part that can be seen are the face and the hands up to the wrist. There are some scholars who say that even this should be covered. The remaining five criteria are the same for the man and the woman. The second is the clothes they wear, it should not be tight so that it reveals the figure. Third, it should not be transparent or translucent so that you can see through. Number four, it should not be so glamorous so that it attacks the opposite sex. Number five, it should not resemble that of the unbeliever. And there's the hadith in Sai Muslim, volume number three, in the book of dress, hadith number 5173, where once a person was wearing a saffron colored clothes. So the Prophet said that, remove this color. This color resembles that of the unbeliever. Saffron is the color of the unbeliever. So you should not wear clothes that resemble that of the unbeliever. And especially that which is a sign of unbeliever like wearing a cross as a sign of Christianity, putting a vermilion or a tikka as a sign of Hinduism. So you should not wear those which are signs of the unbeliever. And the sixth criteria is, you should not wear clothes 
that of the opposite sex. There's a hadith in Sai Bukhari, volume number 7, the book of dress, hadith number 5885, where the Prophet said, the men should not behave like the women and should not wear clothes like that of the women. And the women should not behave like men, should not have manners like men and should not wear clothes, etc. So these are the basically six criteria of hijab. But this one talks about the clothes. Besides this, for the complete hijab, it even includes the way a person talks, the way a person walks, the way a person thinks, the way a person carries him or herself. All this put together is the hijab. And Allah further says in the Quran, in Surah Azab, chapter number 33, verse number 59, O Prophet, tell the believing woman that when they go abroad, they should put on the cloak so that they shall be recognized and it will prevent them from being molested. And I always give an example that if there are two twin sisters who are very beautiful, equally beautiful, if they're walking down the streets of maybe London, the city where you stay, and if one of the sisters is wearing the complete hijab, complete body covered, except the face and hands up to the wrist, and the other twin sister who's equally beautiful, she is wearing the western clothes, mini skirts are short. And around the corner, there is a hooligan who is waiting for a catch. I want to ask you the question, which girl will it tease? Will it tease the girl wearing the mini skirt or will it tease the girl wearing the hijab? Which girl will it tease? Ooh, definitely the one with the mini skirt. That's right. So Quran rightly says that hijab has been prescribed for the woman so that it will prevent them from being molested. So these are the basic six criteria of hijab. And furthermore, there are other rulings about clothes, etc. As far as the gender clothes are concerned, for the men, our beloved Prophet said, that the gold and silk are prohibited. It's mentioned in Sunan Nisai, Book of Zenith, chapter number 40, hadith number 5147, where the beloved Prophet said, two things, gold and silk are forbidden for the males of my ummah, but they're permissible for the females. Furthermore, you get guidance from the hadith that the trousers, the lower garment, should be above the ankle. It should not be below the ankle. And it's mentioned in the hadith of Sai Bukhari, volume number seven, book of dress, Hadith number 5787, the beloved Prophet said that the izar, the trouser that hangs below the ankle, that will be in fire. As we discussed in the previous episode, wearing trousers and lower garment below the ankle is prohibited. Further, we get guidance that wearing dress of fame and those which make you outstanding as compared to the other people around you, like those that the kings wear and the leaders proving that they are superior, it is prohibited. It's mentioned in Sunan Abu Dawud, hadith number 4018 and 4019, that the person who wears the clothes for fame and for glamour, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will clothe them with that on the day of resurrection. And the other version says that Allah will clothe them with disgrace on the day of judgment, on the day of resurrection. There are further guidelines given that it's preferable that you wear white clothes. And a prophet said, it's mentioned in Sunan Abu Dawud, in the book of dress, volume number three, hadith number 4050, the Prophet said that wear white garments because they are the best of your garments and shroud the dead person in white. And further, a beloved Prophet Muhammad said, it's mentioned in Sunan Abu Dawud, volume number three, in the book of dress, hadith number 4129, the Prophet said that whenever you wear a garment or do wudu, you start with the right hand. So this is also sunnah that when you're wearing a garment, start with the right hand. So these are the few rulings which we get in the Quran and the Hadith regarding the hijab, the dress code, and regarding what you can follow the sunnah as far as wearing the dress is concerned. Zakhalak here, Dr. Zakir. I'm sure that we could talk for a whole episode and more on just that topic alone. So um, now we're going to move on to the many questions we've got on the topic, Ramadan, the month of self-improvement and Islam, relating to some of the sunnahs we've been talking about in the last couple of episodes. And uh, so let's get the first question. So Dr. Zakir, the first question from the uh, worldwide audience of Peace TV, Alhamdulillah. May Allah guide them and have mercy upon them. Amen. What is the purpose of sunnah in Islam? Um, isn't the Quran enough for guidance? Question mark. As far as what is the purpose of Sunnah and isn't the Quran sufficient, there are some people, so-called modernist, inverted commas, they call themselves modernists, the Muslims, they say that isn't the Quran sufficient, why have to refer to the Sunnah? And 
they fail to realize that the Sunnah is the unavoidable second source of Islam. The authentic hadith of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his sayings, his actions, his approval yes. are very important for us to understand the Quran. And in fact, the Sahih Hadith, the authentic hadith, the Sunnah of the Prophet is the commentary of the Quran. There are certain verses which are there in the Quran which may not require any commentary. The Qiyakat, for example, Kul Hullah Ahd, says Allah one and only. To understand that, it's simple, Allah is one, don't require a commentary. But there are many other verses which without the hadith, without the sunnah, you cannot follow the verses. For example, the Quran says that a Muslim who is rich, he should give zakat. So the Quran does not specify how much percentage of zakat he should give. Only when you read the hadith of the Prophet, the sunnah of the Prophet, you come to know that if you have wealth, gold, silver, money, etc., you have to give 2.5% of that wealth. As we discussed earlier, if it's a farm produce crop, then without irrigation 10%, with irrigation 5%, and so on and so forth. Without the hadith, how will you come to know? The Quran does specify the people who you can give zakat to, but how much to give is not mentioned. Furthermore, the Quran says you should offer salah. Certain things are mentioned in the Quran about sujood, about ruku, but the details aren't mentioned. How many rakat you have to offer salah? What are the exact postures of salah, where to keep your hand, etc. So that you get from the sunnah. So imagine the pillars of Islam cannot be followed without the hadith. It's so important. As Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Azab, chapter number 33, verse number 21, Verily, in the Prophet is the most beautiful pattern of conduct. And that is the reason Allah says in several verses in the Quran, including Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse 59, that, Atiullah wa Atiur Rasul, obey Allah and obey the Messenger. That means, if you have to obey Allah, you have to obey the Messenger. And obeying the Messenger is obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Therefore, Sunnah is unavoidable. There are some verses of the Quran where the commentary of the Quran is found in the Quran itself. But many other places in the Quran, the hadith is a must for commentary. For example, I'll give you just a few examples for a better understanding. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 38, As to the thief, be it a man or a woman, chop off his or her hand as a punishment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that means anyone who robs anything, Anyone who steals anything, according to the Quran, has to chop off hands. But when we go to the detail, when we go to the hadith, when we go to the sunnah of the Prophet, we come to know. It's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number 8, in the book of Hudud, hadith number 6789. The beloved Prophet Muhammad said that anyone who robs a quarter of a dinar or more, you should chop off his hand. That means if he robs less than that, then there's no chopping off hand. Imagine someone steals bread because they cannot eat. So will you chop off his hand? No. And it's the duty of the ruler of that area, the caliph of that area, to look after his basic needs. But someone robs for his pleasure, etc., then it's haram. Chopping is a must. Secondly, where will you chop his hands from? You get from the hadith. The Prophet said, you come from the hadith, from the wrist. Others people may think you can chop from the fingers, you can chop from the elbow, you can chop from the upper arm. Where do you chop from? From the hadith you come to know, it's from the wrist. There are several such examples in the Quran a person can give where sunnah is a must. For example, Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse 101, when he travel through the earth, there is no blame on you if you shorten your prayers for fear of the unbelievers that they will attack you. For the unbelievers to you are an avowed enemy. Now here the Quran clearly says that you can shorten your prayer when you're traveling for the fear of the unbelievers that they may harm you, etc. There's a hadith which is mentioned in Sahih Muslim, volume number one, hadith number 1461, where one of the Sahaba, he asked Hadith Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, that the Quranic verse says that when he travel, you can shorten your prayers for the fear of the enemy. But now there is no fear of enemy, so why should we shorten it now? So Hadith Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, he replies, I asked the same question to the Messenger of Allah, and he said, this is charity for you. So accept the charity of Allah. That means whenever you travel, irrespective you have the fear of the enemy or not, fear of the unbeliever or not, yet you can shorten. If the hadith wasn't there, the Quranic verse only gives one type of reason, but you can get the commentary in the hadith. So from the hadith you come to the whenever you travel, and then what's the distance? Then again you come to the hadith. It is approximately more than 80 kilometers. You get that what is the distance where a person is called as a traveler. Then again you get the details in the hadith. 
So from the hadith you come to know that whenever you travel more than 80 kilometers, then you call the traveler and you can shorten your prayers. And you should shorten because that's a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's a charity from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You can go on and on giving examples, but I'll just give one more example. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Anam chapter number 6 verse number 145 that I have only been prohibited to eat those foods which are mentioned in the Quran and the verse continues that Hurramat alaykumul maytutubaddam wa lahmul khilzeel wa ma'ulla li gairlabi which means that forbidden for you for food are dead meat, blood, the flesh of swine and any food on which any name besides Allah's name is taken. So by this verse you come to know that only these four types of food are prohibited. All the others you can have. But for details when you go to the hadith there are several hadith which say that even other types of food are prohibited. For example, it's mentioned in Sahih Muslim, volume number 3, hadith number 4752. The beloved Prophet Muhammad said that forbidden for you to eat are the birds of prey. Those birds which have got talons, which have got claws. So these birds are prohibited, which is not mentioned in the Quran, it's mentioned in the hadith. There are several hadith mentioning Sahih Muslim and Sahih Bukhari that forbidden for food are the animals which attack others, which are carnivorous animals, meat-eating animals like tiger, leopard, cheetah, lion, etc. It's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari in the book of Fluttering, hadith number 5528. The beloved Prophet said that forbidden for you to eat is the meat of the donkey. So all these things are not mentioned in the Quran. You have to go to the hadith. So from the hadith, you get the more details. Quran is more of a telegraphic message. It's very important, very authentic, alhamdulillah. But for commentary, you have to go to the hadith. So that's the reason hadith is unavoidable. And it's a must. That's what a beloved Prophet said. It's mentioned in Mustadak al-Hakim, hadith number 319. That the Prophet said that I leave behind the Quran and my example and my sunnah. So if anyone who holds to the Quran and my sunnah, he will always be on the straight path. He will not go wrong. So that's the reason sunnah is the unavoidable second source of Islam, without which you cannot understand Islam in totality. No, clearly, it wouldn't be very practical just to have the Quran without the hadith, as you've uh, eloquently explained, Dr. Zakir. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide all those people I mean. who otherwise are doing something else. Next question. Is it correct for a Muslim to reply in the same manner to the one who abuses him whilst he is doing islah? As far as when a person is doing isla or dawa, the guidelines are given in the Quran. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Nahl, chapter number 16, verse number 125, Udu ila wal mu'azid al hasna, hasan, which means invite all to the way of thy Lord with wisdom and beautiful preaching, and argue with them and reason with them in the ways that the best and most gracious. So as far as dawa is concerned, or if is concerned, we should do with hikmah and husna in ways that are best, most gracious, with beautiful preaching. Even if you're opposite person, the Muslim or non-Muslim, while doing Islam Dawa, he gets angry, he starts cursing, he starts giving verbal abuse, yet you should be kind and loving the way the Prophet was. And we see in the example of the Prophet that many a time the non-Muslims, they trouble the Prophet. The Prophet did not retaliate in the same way. And we find several such examples. It's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari. Hadith number 6030, that once a Jew, he comes and wishes the Prophet, Assalam Alaikum. Assalam Alaikum in Arabic means, may death be on you. And the Prophet replies back, on you too. Prophet Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her, the wife of the Prophet. She hears this and she gets very angry. She tells to the Jew, that may Allah's curse be on you. May the wrath of Allah be on you. And she starts getting angry. So the Prophet tells to her that you should be calm, you should be humble, you should not get angry. So Hazrat Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her, she replies that, did you hear what they told you? So the Prophet replies, did you hear what I replied to them? And my dua would be accepted, their dua would not be accepted. So this was the way the Prophet dealt with the people. It's further mentioned in Sahih Muslim, volume number 4, hadith number 6280, that it's not proper for a person who's sitk to invoke curses. Be the person who is sincere. That means it's not right for a believer, a believing Muslim, to invoke curses on others, invoke and speak rudely and verbal abuses, etc. And it's mentioned in the hadith of Tirmidhi, hadith number 2019, that a believer 
should not invoke curses. It's not correct for a believer to invoke curses. And therefore, the Prophet always said that when people get angry, he said that I have come as a mercy and blessing. I have not come as invoker of curses. So here we realize that this was the example that we have to follow. And as Allah says in the Quran in Surah Azab, chapter 33, verse number 21, that verily in the Prophet is the most beautiful pattern of conduct. So while doing da'wah, while doing Islam, we should never get angry, we should not retaliate, we should win them over. Winning over is much better than rather than retaliating. You have to be kind, soft and merciful. Zakhalaka for the answer. Next question, Dr. Zakir, is uh, what is the ruling on the one who commits suicide? And furthermore, what can the parents do to reduce the punishment of the one who has committed suicide? As far as suicide is concerned, we discussed earlier that it is one of the major sins. According to Imam Ad-Dhabi in his book Al-Kabair, he put suicide as number 29th in the list of 70 major sins. And Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 195, make not your own hands the cause of your destruction, indicating very clearly that suicide is prohibited in Islam. And there are various hadith which speak about this. It's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number 7, hadith number 5778, where the beloved Prophet Muhammad said that, Whoever throws himself from the mountain and falls and dies, he will keep on falling perpetually in the hellfire forever. And if a person drinks poison and dies, he will keep on in the hell, have a bottle of poison and keep on drinking it and keep on dying in the hell. And if someone stabs himself, then in the hellfire, he'll keep on stabbing himself forever. And Again, Allah's Messenger repeats the message in Sahih Bukhari, volume number 8, hadith number 6047, where the beloved Prophet Muhammad said that if a person commits suicide and kills himself, in the hellfire, he'll keep on doing that same act. He'll be found in the same way in the hell. The same way they killed himself, he will have the same action done in the hell. And the beloved Prophet Muhammad said, it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number 4, hadith number 3463, that there was a person who had a wound and it was paining him too much. He was impatient. So he takes a knife and he cuts his hand and then he bleeds to death. And the prophet, he says that because he was impatient and he killed himself, he will not enter paradise. And a similar hadith is mentioned in Sahih Muslim, volume number two in the book of Salah. Hadith number 2133, that a person was brought to the Prophet who had killed himself with a broad-headed spear. And he had committed suicide. He was brought to the Prophet. So the Prophet did not read his Janaz Salah. From here we come to know that it is a major sin. But that doesn't mean, when we come to know further, we come to know that the other Sahabas did read the Janaz Salah. It doesn't mean that if a person who commits suicide has done shirk. It's not the biggest sin in Islam. It is a major sin. It is a big sin. But it does not tend to amount to kufr. And if Allah wishes and pleases, He may forgive him. As Allah says in the Quran in Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse 48, and Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse 116, if Allah pleases, He may forgive any sin. But the sin of shirk, He'll never forgive. So that is the reason in such cases when a person who commits suicide, it's a major sin. Every Muslim should be discouraged. But if he does that, they are the Muslims, they should pray for him. Pray for us, maqfira, ask for forgiveness. And similarly, as the question was, what should the parents do of a person who has committed suicide? So the parents should pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive their child if he has committed suicide. And inshallah, Allah is Rahman or Rahim. And if Allah pleases, he may forgive. Jazakallah khair for the answer. And uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive any of those people that have wrongfully killed themselves like this. The last question from our viewers today is some people think it's not obligatory to enjoin what is good and forbid what is evil. They quote the verse from Surah Al-Maidah, Surah 5, verse 105. O oh, you who believe, guard your own souls. If you follow the right guidance, no hurt can come to you for those who are in error. To support their claim, is it the right interpretation or not? 
as far as the interpretation of this verse of the Quran is concerned, this verse says that, oh, you believe, no harm will come to you if you follow the right guidance. So the criteria of this verse is that you should follow the right guidance. And if you read the commentary of this verse, right guidance is what? Right guidance is enjoining what is good and forbidding what is wrong. As Allah says in the Quran in Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 110, Kuntum khaira ummatin khridat nas. O ye Muslims, ye are the best of people evolved for mankind. Enjoining what is good and forbidding what is wrong. Ta'miruna bil ma'rufi wa tanhawna ayin munkat wa tu'minuna billah. Enjoining what is good and forbidding what is wrong and believing in Allah. So, if you have to be on the right guidance, Allah says, you have to enjoin what is good and forbid what is wrong and believe in Allah. If we do not enjoin what is good and if we do not forbid what is wrong, we are unfit to be called as khaira ummah. So even according to this verse, you have to enjoin what is good and forbid what is wrong. And the criteria for any Muslim to go to Jannah are given in Surah Al-Asr, chapter number 103, verse number 1 to 3, which says, Wal Asr. Innal insana la fi khusr, illa lazin amanu wa amilu salihati wa tawasaw bil haqqa tawasaw bil sabr. By the token of time, man is verily in a state of loss, except those who have faith, those who have righteous deeds, those who exhort people to truth, and those who exhort people to patience and perseverance. For any human being to go to Jannah, he requires four things. That Iman, number one, righteous deeds. Number two, number three, Watawasa bil haq, exhorting people to truth. And number four, exhorting people to patience and perseverance. If any one of these four is missing, you shall not enter Jannah. You may be a very good Muslim, you may be offering salah, you may have gone for hajj, you may be paying zakat. But if you don't do dawah, if you don't enjoy what is good and forbid what is wrong, you will not go to Jannah. If Allah wants to forgive you and put you in Jannah, that's a different question, that's his prerogative. As Allah says in Surah Nisa chapter 4, verse 48, and Surah Nisa chapter 4, verse 116, if he wishes he may forgive any sin, but the sin of shirk he will not forgive. But in normal circumstances, all four things are equally important. Iman, righteous deeds, exhorting people to truth, that is dawah and islah, and exhorting people to patience and perseverance. Therefore, dawah and islah is one of the criteria for any Muslim, for any human being to go to Jannah. Well, Jazakallah khair. Once again, Dr. Zakia, we've come to the end of the show. And I would ask all of those brothers and sisters who are watching to tune in at the same time tomorrow when we will be discussing a very important topic of dawah to non-Muslims, insha'Allah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. <laughs> قانتين خاشعين قانتين خاشعين مسلمين مؤمنين للإله عابدين شهونا صوم وعتق وقنوت فيه صدق يومنا صبر ورق بدموع البائسين رمضان قد أهل بالصيام وأطل مسعدا أهلا وخلا لتوفي Thank you.